Welcome to the Stereoactive Movie Club. My name is Jeremiah, and I'm here with Alicia, Laura, Mia, and Stephen. And we're going to be talking about the 1962 film Lawrence of Arabia, directed by David Lean. Also joining us for this episode is Matt, who is not only an old friend of mine, but is also a history professor and a fan of Lawrence of Arabia. So thanks for being here, Matt. Thanks for having me. Hi, Matt. Hello. Hi, Matt. But before we go on, let's hear from everyone about what movies they've watched since the last time we recorded. Mia, how about you? So I've been watching the Twilight Saga. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so far, Jeremiah and I have watched Twilight and then Twilight New Moon. Right, Twilight New Moon is that how you say the title? Yeah, whatever. Wait, whatever. Are you are you saying you never saw it before? So I've seen the first two, but last night we started Eclipse. And I haven't seen that one before. All right. So, but I'd seen them. I saw the second one in theaters, and I saw the first one like at home, but like a few months before then. Um, my youngest sister is obsessed with Twilight, so we also <laughs> have been having like a fun running commentary about it. Um. But yeah, they're really bad and ridiculous. <laughs> and it's just That's like That's shocking. Oh my I, god. I actually think the first one has merit visually. Really visually, really it definitely makes me want to go to the Pacific know. Northwest. <laughs> I like it. I do. I did too, Laura, actually. I did like the first one. I mean, obviously the parts where she's like pouring empty ketchup bottle and like the weird jerky stuff. And I mean, it's a ridiculous premise, but Yes. Yeah, sorry. I just find yeah. it so disturbing. Like her entire life and personality is wrapped up in this person. I just think this is such a problematic message to send to the youth of America, the youth of the world, especially to young women. Like just watching it, I'm like, oh my God. Like, why are her parents not intervening more here? Like, this is not okay. And then she's just going to become a fucking vampire and like sayonara to her family for this dude she's known for like, six months a year maybe at this point like it's just i know it's like but, teen but Mia, mormon he, romance but god he, he sparkles in the sunlight he i mean really he's good. very very pretty when he's you, get that, you can't just get that <laughs> anywhere we're we're a team jacob household so you know oh. yeah <laughs> yeah they're not good they're not good but um i wanted to watch them just because i thought that they'd be fun to just kind of watch and make fun of and i'd listen to my favorite movie podcast they just did like commentaries on all five movies that i listened to having never seen the movies just because they always go into like context of like film history and what was going on in culture at the time and they made me just sort of interested enough to watch these things that i had avoided for over a decade basically um, but now Jeremiah but yeah. knows everything that's going to happen. I mean, yeah, not that they're like true. so shocking or anything like that, but you know, they're pretty dumb. I want to lean into it. And he's like, oh, this is when I, he's going to jump out. And I'm like, stop. Like, come on, man. <laughs> um, anything else? No. Okay. So I also watched Gunpowder Milkshake, a new movie with uh, Karen Gillan. Not the best. I did see Pig, the new Nicolas Cage movie, which is fucking great. I highly recommend it. Um, I rewatched Midnight Run while I was at a doctor's appointment where I had to just sit there for uh, four hours. <laughs> so I watched a movie. And uh, yeah, then the Twilight movies. I think Steven needs details. <laughs> I know. I was like, I want to hear more about this four hour. Like, I, it was, I was having an allergy thing. test done. So I just had to like take something and sit there and see if I had a reaction. So okay. yeah, it was pretty boring. Did, did you have a reaction? No. So I guess I'm fine. Um, and Stephen, what did you see? Um, I watched Westworld, which was the original 1973 movie um, that was starring Yul Brenner and James Brolin. Um, it was about, in case anybody doesn't know anything about Westworld, it was a movie about an amusement park that people could go to with robots, and it was the Wild West, and the robots run, run amok. Um, really good. Um, Yul Brenner really stole the show, considering he was a robot and he had very few lines, but it was a very enjoyable movie. Okay. And Alicia? Um, I watched a documentary called For Mad Men Only about Del Close, who is an actor who basically pioneered like long form improv comedy and the, the Herald format um, um, that they use at like UCB. And uh, it, was, it was interesting. He's kind of a problematic guy, but, um, but I enjoyed learning more about him. And uh, yeah, it was cool. 
I, I feel like I've heard so many little things about that guy from listening to comedians mm-hmm. talk on podcasts, um, yeah. especially WTF. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Laura, how about you? Well, um, considering the film, the subject that we are talking about today, I went a little bit lighter with my choices. I watched my one of my favorite all-time films, Vibes, with Jeff Goldblum and Cindy mm-hmm. Lauper, Cindy Lauper. Yeah. 1988, directed by Ken Kwapitz, who's actually a pretty accomplished director. It's an amazing film, completely underrated, Peter Fox in it. And I mean, that's all you really need to know. And then, and then I just watched Jolt. Um, yeah. And it was about as lowbrow as you can get. Kate Beckinsdale has an anger violence issue. Um, and so I have a theory about it. I think that if this film was in any, in a foreign language, any foreign language, it would have gotten rave reviews and three stars across the board and been a critic darling. Okay. That's, so that's my theory about it. Never heard I also it. wish they would have toned down her hair color just a touch. It's a bit brassy. Mm. <laughs> All right. And Matt, what movies have you watched lately? Mm, I think the the last movie I watched um, in the last couple of weeks was Solaris. I'd never seen the original. The original, yeah. Mm. Um, you know, it's okay. You might have to cut this out because um, <laughs> I, I just I don't I'm not a huge Tarkovsky fan. I don't think. Um, we talked about Mirror on this podcast a few episodes ago. Okay. Have you seen that one? <laughs> I don't even know. Yeah. Seen that. <laughs> they feel all kind of the same to me in yeah. terms of just the, the pacing and the, <laughs> right. and the low finest, which generally I like, but something something just doesn't click for me with, with Tarkovsky. And then before that, I think um, my wife and I had watched Do the Right Thing, which I hadn't seen in 25 years or something probably, uh, which holds up um, Sad and Emling well. Um, but yeah, that's a great one. Yeah. Um, so for those who may not have listened to the show before, this is a podcast where the five of us are discussing movies that have appeared on sight and sound magazines, poll of the greatest movies ever made. It comes out every 10 years. The next poll will be out in 2022. So we're basically using that as our prompt to watch some classic movies ahead of it. And again, this time we're talking about Lawrence of Arabia, but before we get into the history and background of the movie, what did each of us know about it going into this viewing? Who had seen it before? If not, what were you expecting, if anything? And since uh, Alicia picked this one, why don't you start us off and also tell us why you chose it? Uh, so I have seen this before. I saw it about a year ago for the first time. And I chose it this time because I had a really hard time like connecting to it or getting anything out of it really the first time I watched it. So I wanted to um, discuss it with you guys and get a little more context on it and give it another shot and um, see if I could uh, enjoy it a little bit more this time. Okay. And Stephen? I, of course, have heard of this movie. I think everybody has. I had never seen it before. Um, And everybody always says that it's one of the most visually stunning movies ever made. Um, I was very curious about it. I wished I had seen it on the big screen like when it came out or even in some of the re-releases. Um, and I also knew that it was a really long movie and that it was a really big Oscar winner. But other than that, I didn't know really anything about the story. And Mia. So according to my mother, avid podcast listener, I have not seen this movie because I haven't seen it on the big screen. She <sighs> says, you have to. It's not seeing it unless you do that. So I will when the opportunity presents itself. Um, but I had seen it once before on the small screen. And yeah, I really liked it. I think it was good rewatching it because the first time I was just kind of like, what is going on? Like, who is fighting who? And they're going where? And like, what? (laughs) Whereas this time, I remembered enough of the basics of the plot and stuff to just focus more on the characters. Um, So yeah, it was really enjoyable. I think I got a lot more out of this second viewing of it. Laura? Laura? I knew, like Stephen, that it was really, really long, and I knew that Peter O'Toole had really, really blue eyes. (laughs) Okay. Both accurate. (laughs) Matt, you said you hadn't seen this in a while? In a while, but I think I saw it for the first time when I was probably 15. I mean, I've probably seen it a dozen or so times in my life, and if you had asked me any time between when I first saw it when I was 15 and 
probably my mid 20s, I would have undoubtedly told you it was my favorite movie ever made. I still like parts of it, but I don't have the same odd reverence for it that I did as a teenage uh, teenage boy. But I'm, we can get into all of that. I'm pretty sure I remember you saying it was your favorite film, Yeah, uh, which is why I thought it would be interesting to have you on the podcast since you were, were in town this week. Um, and, oh, and I have seen it on the big screen, by the way. Actually, yeah. too, so I have really seen so it. Does that mean you're the yeah. only one of us that have really, really seen, seen it? it. Mm-hmm. I saw it twice According. on the big screen. Oh, oh all right. Oh. On two of the biggest screens in New York, yeah. <laughs> in fact. Um, I totally agree that that is the best way to yeah. see this movie. It's one of the few movies that I feel like if you have the chance to see it on a big screen, like you have to take it um, because it's made for that format in a way that other movies you can kind of get away with watching it however you're able to watch it and this one gets re-released from time to time so i think it's worth seeking out when it's around when it's playing somewhere near you so i definitely recommend it um i'm hoping everybody liked it enough that they'd be down to go and see it next time it's playing near them uh on the podcast but um yeah i i'm a huge fan of this movie for a long time, I, I said it was my second favorite movie of all time after 2001, A Space Odyssey. Um, I don't know if it's quite in second place for me anymore. I hadn't seen it for quite a while. Then, um, like Mia said, we we watched it uh, a couple years ago, and that was like the first time in a while. And it was kind of weird watching it again. Um, I don't know, just being older and some of the stuff in it, I, I was like really noticing you know some of the more cringy stuff i thought like of of just like the casting of uh alec guinness for instance um which all that was just normal practice in 1962 unfortunately but just watching it through the lens of you know what's going on in our culture over the last several years was like it was a weird re-entry to seeing the film again for the first time in a while but i'm not sure that relates to my experience this time which i'll get to so (laughs) There we go. Ben. So as I've often done on the show, I'm going to read from an entry in the Ultimate Encyclopedia of the Movies, which I got when I was in high school and I was first getting into movies. As always, the parts that may be more subjective aren't from me personally, but perhaps we can delve into those things as we get into our group discussion. David Lean's spectacular epic screen biography of T.E. Lawrence won seven Oscars, including Best Picture, and director. Although attacked by some critics as romanticized and trivialized entertainment, the film provides, through Robert Bolt's skillful screenplay, a clear picture of the complicated politics of Arab unification against the Turks in World War I, while still meeting the cinematic need for dramatic conflict and strong characterization. At the center is the charismatic young Peter O'Toole as Lawrence, blonde, blue-eyed, and driven by an ultimately self-destructive obsession. He is backed by an outstanding supporting cast, which included Alec Guinness, who two years earlier had played Terrence Radigan's very different version of Lawrence in Ross on the London stage as the leader of the Arab revolt against the Turks. Omar Sharif, as the Sheik, who is Lawrence's chief ally in his unification campaign, is introduced in one of the most memorable and famous shots of the film, as a tiny dot on the desert horizon slowly becoming visible as he approaches. Anthony Quinn impresses his tribal leader, Alda Abu Tayyi. Jack Hawkins gives an effective impersonation of General Allenby. Jose Ferrer chills as the Turkish Bey who takes Lawrence prisoner, while Arthur Kennedy is sincere as the journalist who brings Lawrence's exploits to the public. The film won several deserved technical Oscars, including one for Ann Coates' editing, Freddie Young's shimmering 70mm photography of the sun-drenched desert, and Maurice Jarre's memorable score. Again, that was an entry in the Ultimate Encyclopedia of the Movies. The film is adapted from the autobiographical account of T.E. Lawrence himself, Seven Pillars of Wisdom, which was first published in 1926 and told the story of his involvement from 1916 to 1918 with the Arab Revolt against the Ottoman Turks. Though Lawrence of Arabia was released more than 40 years after the events it depicts, it was hardly the first planned production of Lawrence's story for the screen. It was just the first attempt to actually make it to production. Lawrence himself was even involved in early attempts to sell the film rights to his book to help pay off debts he'd incurred in producing the first, very exclusive run of Seven Pillars of Wisdom. He lost interest and even worked against further attempts to adapt his work, as he eventually was able to pay his debts. 
After his death in 1935, Lawrence's brother took on the task of overseeing his brother's legacy so far as rights were concerned. Over the decades, many filmmakers, chief among them legendary silent and early sound era producer and director Alexander Korda, courted Lawrence, his estate, and biographers who owned rights to their own versions of the story. But it was ultimately producer Sam Spiegel who secured the rights, looking to follow up on his successful production of The Bridge on the River Kwai with director David Lean. Early on, after announcing the production, Spiegel also announced Marlon Brando would play the lead, adding him to a long list of actors who'd been in talks or announced for the role over the years, from Leslie Howard to Alec Guinness. Eventually, though, Peter O'Toole was cast, and it became a star-making turn for him. By most accounts, the extremely long shoot, which took place in Jordan, Morocco, and Spain, was hellish, but the resulting super Panavision 70mm cinemascope film, which premiered in December of 1962, went on to great success largely with both audiences and critics. Not all critics loved the film, though. Both Bosley Crowther at the New York Times and Andrew Saris at the Village Voice called it out for being an inaccurate or incomplete portrayal, but it went on to be the second highest grossing film in North America of 1962, not very far behind The Longest Day. It was re-released theatrically several times over the years, often in increasingly edited down versions before a restored version was assembled and distributed in 1989 with the participation of David Lean. And it's been re-released in theaters multiple times since then, mainly to celebrate major anniversaries of the film's release. In addition to its seven Oscar wins for Best Picture, Director, Art Direction, Cinematography, Film Editing, Score, and Sound, it was also nominated for Best Actor, Peter O'Toole, Best Supporting Actor, Omar Sharif, and Best Adapted Screenplay, Robert Bolt and Michael Wilson. Notably, Gregory Peck won Best Actor that year for To Kill a Mockingbird. It won plenty of other awards at the time as well, and eventually ended up on the AFI 100 Years 100 Movies list at number 5 and number 7, respectively, in 1998 and 2007. It's also been recognized on several other greatest films lists over the years. As for our purposes, Lawrence of Arabia has actually never appeared in the top 10 or as a runner-up on Sight & Sound Magazine's critics poll of the greatest films of all time, but it did rank at number 4 on their poll of directors in 2002. So, Alicia, since, again, this was your pick, why don't you start us off with your thoughts on the film? Did it live up to your expectations, um, memories, etc.? Yeah, I guess I, I did enjoy it a little bit more this time around than I did the first time around. I also had a similar experience as Mia, I think, the first time I watched it, whereas I was just very confused a lot of the time about what was happening. Uh, and I think that was also not helped because I was like probably playing a game on my phone or something while I was trying to watch <laughs> But I didn't do that this time. Um, and yeah, I, I enjoyed it more, but I still um, had a little trouble, like, yeah, connecting to it. I don't dislike the movie. It's just like not a, it's just like doesn't have a huge emotional impact for me. Okay. And Stephen? Um, I really enjoyed the movie. I had never seen it before. Um, and it really lived up to my expectations as far as movie making was concerned. And, you know, knowing that it was released in 1962 and just the way that it, um, when it transitioned into like when the, the, uh, the match was blown out and then we saw the big screen, it really did kind of take my breath away, even seeing it on a regular size television and just seeing how epically it kind of put out. And that was a good word that you described it as being epic, Jeremiah, because I felt like that the entire movie, just how grandiose it was. So in that respect, I really did enjoy the movie. It was kind of problematic as everybody has been saying about like the, the acting choices, but as far as, the, as far as the personalities go and, um, as far as uh, Peter O'Toole's acting went, I felt like I was on a journey with him and him trying to figure out who he was. So I was kind of along for that. The political stuff was kind of went over my head sometimes and I did have a hard time following, you know, what the intrigue was. But for the most part, I felt like it really was a movie worth seeing and also seeing just the disparity between like Eastern and Western cultures. Um, especially in the realm of like 1962. And the fact that the movie, I guess the people who were involved in it were 40 years removed from 1962, I'm sure it had a different impact than it would for someone in 2021. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, like I said earlier, you know, I thought that this, my second watch of it, I got a lot more out of it. Um, I think it's a hard movie, I think, to watch the first time and really get 
you know, there's not like a huge plot to it, but I think there is some of that like war movie where it's just like people go this way and fight and then they go this way and then there's this and you're kind of like, wait, what are what are they trying to do here again? And it's also, at least from my younger American perspective, like a relatively obscure part of World War One, a war that I don't know that much about in general. Um, I, I don't even think I knew before this movie that they fought in the Middle East in World War One. Um, so anyways, all that to say, I think overall to me, it's like this study of this one man, small person in this huge, like literally huge desert landscape. And also just showing that in the hugeness of history, this one person can change this whole narrative. Obviously, there was like other people involved, but like, you know, this took down the Ottoman Empire. Like, uh, that's crazy. <laughs> um, so I think that as just a story is really interesting. And this time I got a lot more out of watching um, Peter O'Toole's acting and his journey as a person and like his internal inner struggles with he likes killing but he's also you know wants to be fair and a good person quote unquote is he losing himself in this larger than life narrative being built around him i just i found all that really interesting and got a lot more out of that um like alicia was saying i don't have like a at least now i don't have a huge emotional connection with this film but i think even after watching it the first time and kind of getting like the basics of the plot. Okay. This is very visually impressive. I love Omar Sharif. So I'll watch him and anything. And then, okay, now this time I feel like I got more into the characters. So I am curious to see if like watching it a third time, especially on the big screen, if I might start to have even more of a emotional connect with the movie. But also I just think like the movie making is obviously incredible like the editing is incredible the effort that it took i was reading some about how you know some days they would only get one shot in because it'd be these epic desert shots and like one thing would go and they'd have to reset everything and just i don't know just how you keep your eye on the ball that whole time when you're coordinating like a thousand people in the thousand degree desert <laughs> and getting one shot a day like I think I would just lose my mind if I was the director and just be like, wait, what am I doing? Like, this is insane. I can't keep doing this. So I think it's just a really impressive film overall. And Matt? This time watching through it, like I still am awed by the spectacle of it. It's, if not the most beautiful movie ever made, certainly the most beautiful movie I've ever seen. I still think that, right? Um, after however many viewings of it. And of course, watching it again, like after a number of years of not seeing it, right? Like I have this sort of nostalgic reaction just within my own life to seeing the shots and to hearing the score and to all. The, and so that was, that was, you know, interesting and somewhat emotional just in that respect, because um, I've had so much time in my life where I've thought in, about this movie and 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 wanted to re-experience it. Watching it again as a middle-aged man creates some different responses for me this time around um in terms of the way that the narrative is sort of constructed in the film you know i increasingly have sort of difficulty seeing it as anything other than kind of a british imperial sort of fever dream post suez and you know the decline of the greatness of the british empire and the sort of nostalgic effort to reclaim some mm -hmm some power in that that really stuck out to me this viewing in ways that it obviously didn't when I was when I didn't know to look for that kind of stuff um I have problems with the narrative of you know this sovereign white man right who goes in and single-handedly right like like coalesces a people towards revolt that's a superficial narrative on the one hand and also just like really really problematic historically and in terms of general representation of all of the different forces and factors that went into the Arab revolt. At the same time, I do recognize that it is supposed to be a story about Lawrence, right? Um, and I think that we can talk about this later. Um, I don't want to monopolize too much of the time at the outset here, but I think that there are some areas in the film where there's indications that we're getting a sort of fantasy. Mm -hmm picture of what what happened there right that that's sort of built into how the the film is is uh, uh 
unfolds. But um, but those are those are my reactions this time, right? That that it's actually a much more complicated movie than I used to think, um, and that uh, my relationship to it is certainly changing uh, as a result. Right. And Laura, how about you? I think about this film in three different ways. First is visually, and it's obviously a triumph, um, just fascinating to watch. I've never seen anything like it. I would love to see it on the big screen. Um, second, I think about the character, like what Mia was talking about that Peter O'Toole plays. I don't think it's just a steady decline. I think it's a really interesting um, exploration of his masochism versus sort of repressed sadism. Um, mixed with a a healthy God complex and how that all sort of plays out during this four hour film. And it's just, it's never simple, but it's always fascinating to watch. He, um, he's captivating. And then in the third way, the political way, uh, and I think everyone's spoken to it, you know, actors, Anthony Quinn, Alec Guinness in dark brown face. You know, it's just what was done then, but it's very strange to watch now. The idea of the white savior is also a factor. And then the way the story is told with the um, the infighting between the different tribes make it as if it's impossible that they could ever really live a peaceful, stable Arabic existence there. Um, and And so, you know, it's also... So it's complicated film, but it's really enjoyable to watch. Um, I understood why it was as long as it was. I thought I'd be really impatient and cranky about it, but I wasn't. Yeah. Like I said before, I had kind of a reaction to it when we watched it a couple of years ago and my, it, it being my first time in quite a while to see it again, where I had a very different reaction and it's probably kind of similar to what Matt was explaining of being like a different age and just coming at it with different perspective. And, um, I think if I remember correctly watching it, then it it was the first time it really hit me how much of, in addition to being an epic film in terms of the scope, it, it tells the story in, it's also so intimate in a different way it's like a psychological drama about this guy losing his fucking mind in the desert essentially or losing his path or however you want to describe it and i i don't think that that had ever quite hit me that hard before i watched it more as like an epic adventure when i was younger and i i I appreciated for our purposes of this discussion that i'd seen it again somewhat recently because i felt like that kind of got that Uh, out of the way for me where I could watch it again, like uh, in a different way, sort of like I think a couple of you described of watching it for your second time and it being um, easier to sort of like engage with it more fully. Like I felt like I was able to do that again on this watch. And I, it's sort of like if, if it dipped a little for me a couple of years ago, watching it again, it kind of rose back up for me in terms of my estimation of it this time. And uh, one thing is that I I started rereading this book about the making of Lawrence of Arabia um, since I knew we were going to be watching it for this. And I haven't read a ton of it on this reread. I got this book like after I first saw the movie back in high school or something. And the book goes into how this movie got made and why it got made. And I think I was watching it with an eye on some of that this time. And that that kind of gave me an interesting view of it so yeah I, th- I think that basically like i was watching it this time with the idea in my head that in 1962 for people in england lawrence was very much still a big personality in their culture for a lot of people not everybody i'm saying but he, he would was a very famous person um over there and over here i think but apparently he was still such a big figure that like w- when he died he'd been sort of like courted by people in the British establishment about coming back into the military to help them like reorganize the military because they, you know, saw this other world war coming and they knew that Hitler was going to be a problem. And so like he was a major factor before his death. And I think thinking about the movie in terms of like how large a person he was, even in 1962, and how big a deal it was for a movie to finally get made about him. It, it's it's kind of weird to view it that way, 
when I feel like these days, if anybody knows about Lawrence of Arabia, it's because of the movie and not the other way around, if that makes sense. Um, so it was, it was interesting watching it sort of turned around that way um, for the first time, if that makes sense again. But um, yeah, so there, there's my take. Anybody have anything they want to go to first before we get into the questions? Well, I read a funny story that you might obviously know this, Jeremiah, because of the book that Peter O'Toole was so scared of. Had He had fallen off of a camel, so they got blind drunk. And there's one whole sequence that he just doesn't remember making because he was, <laughs> they were strapped to the camel and just completely wasted. Well, I think he was drunk through most of the production. You yeah. think, well, that, and that's most of his career. Of his <laughs> <laughs> uh, sounds like he and Omar Sharif had like some crazy adventures yeah. during filming. Because they were like, you know, because they were filming for what, like most of a year in the desert? Or like, I guess they were in Spain, but mostly in Jordan and Morocco, mm -hmm. I think. So they're just like in the desert no alcohol, no women, nothing. So like when they had like a free weekend, they would like charter a plane and just like fly to wherever and <laughs> party basically. Um, so yeah, it sounds like it was a fun set. But like, I think he also just like got <laughs> injured all the time too. Yeah. Like so many broken bones. Chafed from riding a camel. Yeah, bit by a camel, oh, yeah. like just all this stuff. I think it was very intense. Yeah. I, mean, I think it really was a hellish shoot for everyone involved. Like, I mm. I would not have wanted to no. work on this film. I mean, in one hand, sure, it would be great to be a part of film history in that way. But it's just like a lot that you put on the line to make a movie like this. I guess it also it depends on how you look at the desert and mm. what it does for you as well. Like, do you think it's clean the way right. he did? Or, you know, maybe some people really come alive in that kind of different area climate right another thing this book that i'm reading the foreword is by martin scorsese and he talks about how when he saw this movie he had never seen uh, an epic married together with sort of like an anti-hero and he connects it directly to the searchers which we also talked about on this podcast previously um, and it being sort of like a similar thing of like this guy who is a very conflicted character. Um, you're not sure maybe you're supposed to be on his side all the time. He is this sort of larger than life person who is almost superhuman in some ways, but he's also incredibly flawed. And uh, he, he talks about it as if it's like an epic married with film noir specifically. I'm not sure I would go that far. I think he's kind of stretching the definitions <laughs> there, but I thought it was an interesting take. And I definitely understand the searcher's connection. I think some people have even speculated that David Lane was uh, kind of inspired visually by the searchers and the look of Monument Valley and stuff like that. Laura? He wasn't always on his own side, mm -hmm. you know, as a character. So of course, you know, you struggle with him multiple times. You know, it's a very, it's a very complex portrayal. So I, that was just what I wanted to say to that. Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that I would call it a white savior movie or not I, I guess that was something i was also trying to think about watching at this time um because like i'm not sure he actually saves anyone especially himself he just kind of like i said earlier drives himself mad i feel like a white savior movie is a little more um usually clean in a way of it's like this clean narrative of this white person coming in and making everything perfect for everybody and then walking away um, I think there's an argument to be made against that, but Steven's been wanting to say something. I'm sorry. Uh, just two things. Um, one about the anti-hero. I don't necessarily think he was an anti-hero because I feel like I sympathized with him so much at the beginning, not being able to figure out what kind of person he was until he was sort of respected with the people that he was with. And then he sort of changed. And maybe even towards the end, I don't necessarily thought that he was even an anti-hero. It was more like, he was sort of trying to please the people that were around him by acting in a way that was sort of like in hyperdrive almost, and that he wanted to kind of impress them or to do what he thought that they, what was best, but it just wasn't working out for him. Um, so I wouldn't think that he was an anti-hero at all. He was more of a sympathetic character more than anything else, I felt. Alicia? I definitely don't think he starts out as an anti-hero. Like you really like him at the beginning of the movie and he, you think like this is going to be like the hero. <laughs> but I definitely think for me, he became an anti-hero. 
an anti-hero um, over the course of the movie. And I do think like the white savior thing, I think it's about, I think it's a movie about someone who would never think of themselves in that way, but who totally wants to be a white savior. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and then just manages to basically like destroy him, him his, himself in the process and traumatize himself and traumatize a lot of other people and cause a lot of chaos <laughs> and then cause them to lose their sovereignty in the end anyway. Well, I mean, when we get into the film, Prince Faisal and his men are being um, murdered in, by the hundreds, by the Turks and their, and their weapons. And they just have the complete advantage. And Lawrence go, you know, does a really long walk, essentially, and comes up with this impossible plan to help save them. So that's where I would throw in the white savior, yeah. the, the concept of that. I mean, I think white savior becomes, I mean, I don't know if there's a specific definition of what a white savior thing, but, but for me, I had the same response as you, um, uh, Laura, where whether you call it a white savior or not, the narrative is clearly constructed in a way that only the agency of T.E. Lawrence matters mm -hmm. in, in this place at this time. He is the one with the power and the genius and the influence and the ability to make this thing happen, right? Which is preposterous, <laughs> like on its face, right? Right. Yeah. To me, not the white saviorness necessarily, but like his personal anti-hero downfall is at the beginning or towards the beginning of the movie when he proves himself to Omar Sharif by going back and saving the guy. And then he gets him his Arab robes and he's like dancing in them in the desert and is obviously so proud of how he looks and proud that he's, you know, been accepted in this way. And he takes out his knife and looks at his reflection and is like, obviously, like, you know, it's this big, like he's arrived moment for him. And then there's a very similar scene, but the total, you know, black mirror opposite of it towards the end after they massacre these retreating Turkish soldiers who have just massacred like a whole village of people and right. stuff. So yeah. um, I'm not, you know, I'm not justifying anyone's actions here. But anyways, he, you know, goes on this killing spree and all these men that he has under his command go on this no prisoners killing spree. And he at one point, you know, holds up his knife and looks at his reflection again and his robes are tattered and dirty and covered in blood. And it's totally this like what have I become kind of moment. So to me, just kind of having those two like knife mirror shots just so bookended the movie and just really encapsulated like, yeah, dude, like power corrupts. Absolutely. And look, that's an excellent point. Like, yeah. He I, had something inside of that. him that then was able to come out and like act in this horrible way. Like if he'd been stuck in that office in Cairo, he wouldn't have ended up killing a bunch of people and stuff. Like none of this other stuff would have happened all along the way. On the white savior part of it, I think I would have been more directly in that camp of thinking it is a white savior film last time I watched it. I don't know how much of my opinion on that this time is colored by reading about the background of the book and, and of him and his, his history. Apparently like he wanted to write Seven Pillars of Wisdom, um, that this movie is based on because he felt like he'd betrayed the Arab revolt and all the people he'd been associated with there. And he was very conflicted in his real life. I mean, according to this telling anyway. And so I, I don't know. I, I think that the movie definitely takes the form of like a heroic tale but I think it subverts it in enough ways that for me, it, it kind of bends it out of that mold enough that I think it plays with the whole white savior concept. Um, but I think it calls his actions and his attitudes um, into question so much that it's hard for me at the end of the movie to see him as a savior. And I'm not saying I'm right. I think it would be really easy to sway me the other way on it, but that's just kind of how I came down after watching it this time with like trying to pay attention to those nuances of it. Alicia? Um, just Mia's mentioning of like him being corrupted by power sort of made me think of uh, when we watched The Godfather and Michael's eventual corruption. Mm -hmm. I will say like something that I thought that was really different about this one. I know they're both kind of like <laughs> taking place in a so-called war, um, The Godfather and Lawrence of Arabia, but 
Michael never really, I mean, he one time gets his hands dirty, but he never really seems to be like having fun with what he's doing. He's making these choices out of like necessity or responsibility to his family or whatever, his empire, crime empire, whatever right. you want to call it. But yeah. like in Lawrence of Arabia, I feel like there's a lot of scenes where he's just like having fun with it. And at the beginning, you're kind of like, oh yeah, this is fun. <laughs> and then like, by the time they've been, uh, you, by the time they've committed a few massacres and they've, um, they've been, he kidna- he's been kidnapped by the, the Turkish army and tortured and obviously the no prisoners scene you're like okay this is definitely not fun and these choices aren't even being made for like necessary reasons anymore this was just like a just a bloodbath for the sake of committing a bloodbath at the end right so i i mean that makes me wonder if it's like obviously the power thing is there but i feel also there's a bigger like brutality of war thing happening in this one than there is in the godfather i think that's a really interesting point but yet i keep coming back to the idea that he loved to t- to put out matches between his fingers oh yeah and, he's a and total that, and that in of itself is just a, there's a certain enjoyment of the pain right yeah. mm-hmm. which i think perpetuated throughout the film um in a very dark way so yeah there was it was it was hard because I mean a lot of the times in the first two hours I was just having as much fun I feel like as he was you know and then it just stopped being fun for all yeah. of us but yeah. it was um, it was pretty heavy and I'm not saying I disagree with you Alicia and I also oh, don't no. disagree with you Jeremiah about the white savior thing I think it's it's a point and to not broach the subject would be missing it but right. I, I when it comes to the end it's it's a completely different story yeah um, I think to the scene after the after they massacre all the turkish soldiers when the photographer journalist guy shows up and is like oh my god like you know what happened here this is so horrible and omar sharif has that really great uh dialogue where he's like oh yeah you know basically like only the arabs could be so barbarous like only the arabs could do something like this when you know and obviously he's like dripping just sarcasm and rage in this scene that Lawrence, this white, refined, you know, British man, refined in air quotes here, is who led these people into this. And it's like, you know, people at the time in England and in America and still today have these, you know, preconceived notions about what people in the Middle East are like, what Arabic people are like. And it's like, no, like, white people are just as shitty in all of these ways like this is what happened here so i thought that was also just like such a powerful yeah. scene such like a fine point on stuff right and and i do want to say that i i feel like i am parsing it maybe finally in a way because i i definitely think what matt said before about it being a portrayal of imperialism british imperialism is completely true obviously um but i guess i'm separating that from the individual in a way, like I think it's a it's a portrait of a man, primarily, and I think that he as an individual is very conflicted. Is at times seemingly self aware that he is, you know, kind of going down these dark paths, but can't help himself um, to a large degree. But that doesn't excuse the whole Britishness of it all and the imperialism of it of of him like taking sort of. I don't know if advantage is the right word, but um, for his own personal, like sort of enjoyment or satisfaction in a way, I guess it is um, taking advantage of this, this actual movement that exists or that he thinks should exist to overthrow one empire, to just install another one um, to rule them. It's, it's definitely problematic, but I think it's a portrayal. And this is something that comes up on the podcast a lot. I think it's a portrayal of that to a large degree. I'm not sure how much it is an endorsement of that, um, I think it's it's trying to, to say that that is, um, you know, problematic in itself. I'm not sure it would go as far. I don't think it went as far in 1962 as they would go with, with saying it's problematic today. I have two points. Um, Lawrence didn't want to, he wasn't trying to get Britain to, to take over. He was right. trying to let them, true, you true. know, control themselves. That's what his goal was. And I think it was blind naiveness. Like, I, I think 
it, it's almost impossible to really believe that that was going to happen. And I, I, you know, I think deep down he probably didn't, but on some level just tried to convince himself of that. I don't know. And second, to Mia's point early, earlier about Omar Sharif's line, I felt like he got all the bangers in the film. Like he just, <laughs> all of the really As good he should. lines. As um, they, were, they were just really cool. I know. I really wish film. that Dr. Zhivago was on this list so that <laughs> we could watch that. <laughs> I just wanted to add something that Mia had said about, you know, the, the line of like the, the Arab nation is the only ones that would be, you know, this barbaric. But I feel like Britain was just an extension of what Lawrence was. I mean, mm-hmm. we mm-hmm. got to see him get his hands dirty. But yet, you know, when you're at the British side, everything's neat as a pin. They play squash. Like there's no like there's no war there and it's all just a game. But he was actually in the trenches. But you just know that if the British had their chance, they would do exactly what they're doing. Right. And yeah. It just, it just made you kind of look at the disparity with that. Well, and I don't know what amongst the Bedouin tribes, what desire there was to like be some sort of nation or more unified or something before Lawrence came along, like in reality. I don't know. And I don't know how involved the Ottoman Empire was in I mean, obviously they're killing them when the movie starts, but prior to World War One, like how were they just kind of like pay us some taxes or give us your resources and it's fine? Or were they like really up in their business? But either way, England came in afterwards and split the area up into all these countries and put tribes together that they knew weren't going to get along, you know, basically did the same thing in Africa and doomed people to, you know, decades more of fighting and instability and look at the problems that we have in the Middle East today. And I think you can trace a lot of that back to the divisions that were made in the world at that time. So it's like Mm -hmm. England just wants to sit there and like draw lines on a map, but they know exactly what they're doing. Like they don't want to get their hands dirty, like literally going and killing people. I totally agree with you, Stephen. But it's like the consequences of what they did are just like so far reaching and so fucked up. Matt, not to put you too on the spot, but I'm curious how much the story in this film uh, intersects with your own studies of history. I was thinking about that when I when I rewatched it to talk about it for this purpose. And I'm not sure I ever really thought about it until now, but I can say pretty confidently that this movie is as much, if not more, reason I'm a professional historian now than anything else in my life. And the reason is kind of related to the things that we're talking about now, right? Like, so when I first watched this movie, I I was just absolutely entranced with the character of Lawrence, right? Um, And the narrative surrounding the amazing things that this man did, right? Supposedly did. Um, and, And how... Yes, yeah. It, recognizing, of course, right, the struggle that he's dealing with in in the narration, the and the dark side that comes out of that. But still, you know, ultimately coming through with this image of this is a remarkable person who did a re- a number of remarkable things, whether they're good or bad, right? That this was just an amazing thing as a as with a developing brain for me to see and think, oh my God, you know, people can do these types of things in the world. And I thought the movie had told me this like amazing truth in some way or another, right? And then I read more about it, you know, and I read Seven Pillars of Wisdom. And then I read the Richard Aldington book from 1955, which is the sort of takedown of the Lawrence cult of personality. And you start to say, oh, my God, there's a lot, this is a lot more complicated. There's a lot more going on here. The story that I got told is a story. It's not the whole story. Parts of it are accurate or whatever and parts of it aren't a lot of it's up for interpretation but this response that i that was elicited from me when i was 15 year olds that was by design right they were trying to get that me to feel this way um and but you read more it gets messy it gets more complicated and i remember actually writing an essay about that basically to get admitted to an honors class that allowed me to write an undergraduate thesis in history And then from there, I went on to grad school and I started studying colonialism and all of the narratives and the stories of colonialism and the ways that they get ingrained, particularly in Western minds, and how absolutely difficult it is to counteract those stories, right, Uh, with any other meaningful narratives or interpretations 
because they get so ingrained, right? Um, and so that when I say like that 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 when I watch it now, I see it as this sort of post-imperial fever dream. And what I'm saying is, right, it's not that it's not that I have a different interpretation of what Lawrence did or didn't do. It's that I have a different interpretation of what they're trying to get you to think with the story they're telling in this movie, right? And what I see now when I watch it is largely a story that revolves around the idea that this white man is the center of the damn universe, right? And it's problematic, sure, right? It's got its upsides and its downsides. It's got its lightness and its darkness. But you can't get away from the narrative that this guy is the center of the fucking world, right? Um, and and that's that in itself is a huge, huge problem, I think, right, that, that Lawrence of Arabia has to deal with now, right? And, you know, I was reading a little bit about this to talk about this on the podcast. I can't talk about it in great detail, but I was real, realizing, you know, out Abu Tai sued Paramount, right? It was like a 10-year lawsuit because he was like, this movie absolutely misrepresented me and the Hawatat and everything that we were doing in this revolt because they didn't care, right? That, that, that didn't matter to the story that they were trying. What actually mattered was presenting him in this very particular way, right? Um, and that's where that's where sort of the imperialism of the narrative uh, comes into play in ways that I think is is it, it, it's just it's usually problematic. It's a great story, right? <laughs> Which but 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 you know that's a problematic story. Did you get into the class? That I, you did. Were <laughs> I did. I did get into the you. class. Yeah. Um, yeah. I wonder if that kind of gets in a better way what I was trying to say. That um, I think as a story about Lawrence, the objective is there of like painting this conflicted portrait of a man. But yeah, I think the details are more problematic with some of the other characters. I, I didn't know that uh, Adu Abu Tai had sued Paramount uh, for 10 years. Like I knew that- It was like a long drawn out lawsuit. Yeah. I don't know any other details about it. I, I had yeah. read that like people who knew him said that it wasn't a great portrayal of him because he was a very generous person. Right. And not kind of like the asshole he's portrayed as in this movie. I think he's heroic in the movie, but it's like, you know, it's it's kind of a caricature. Uh, mm -hmm. but, it is. Uh, yeah, and, and I, I think that those are the places where the movie is more problematic to me, I guess, is, is the, the characterizations of the other people who are not Lawrence. Um, and I mean, I'm talking, you know, about the, the Arabs in the movie, or the Arab characters, because I don't... They're Bedouin. Yeah. Well, sure. Um, but they're not played by um, sure. <laughs> largely anyone of, of color. Um, yeah. Or uh, at least a couple of the big ones aren't. So, yeah, it's very problematic. I mean, again, yeah, that's what they did back then. And it's good that we moved away from that. For me, the bigger problem with the way that the Arab or Bedouin characters are portrayed in the movie is that once he gets that, he they're never sort of really in charge of their own destiny yeah. and it's then at the end it's just sort of implied that even when they did get power that they couldn't handle it anyway and they wouldn't know how to they wouldn't know how to do it they wouldn't know mm -hmm. what to do with it i think that's like the most insulting thing out of the whole the whole movie it's bad enough that you have not you don't have true representation uh, you know within the actors that's like that's one thing but like just this implication that like there's no way they could ever responsibly rule over themselves is just the worst thing. And then obviously like the British people coming in and just, yeah, like like you said, treating it all as pretty much a game. It's like a power game for them. And it's just, uh, what's the most, what's the way we can exploit this to our advantage? That's all it is. That's all it ever is for like colonialists and imperialists was, was, was how can we benefit from this situation? And we have enough warships and guns and bombs or whatever that we can kind of do whatever we want here. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, that was like the, the worst the worst thing, even worse than the white savior thing, although that plays into it as well. But that was like the worst thing to me. Yeah, that that scene of the council is maybe for me the cringiest in the movie. Watching it now, but um, yeah. yeah, well, and just the concept that like, you know, you have all these people here who most of them have been living nomadic lives without electricity, without water pumps, like whatever they end up arguing about, and it's like. Well, yeah, no shit. They're not going to be able to figure out how to like run a city overnight. I guess the actual council like went on much longer than is portrayed in the movie. But still, it's just like, okay, this this is not realistic here. But I mean, the British, I, th you know, even before that, 
they were not just going to be like, oh, yeah, sure. Here you go. Of course. Like, yeah. <laughs> take this land. Go for it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, they're not going to give them, like, the kind of, like, support they would need to actually, like, move towards being a functioning country, democracy, whatever. It's not in well, their only interest. Only they can be in charge of it. Only right. They can, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. It's on their timetable. <laughs> right. right. Well, I, I meant, like, they're not going to, like, help any kind of self-determination right. here. Right. It's mm -hmm. going to be, like, you need to become... A British subject. Yeah. Right. Well, why don't we go ahead and move into Alicia's questions? So, uh, Alicia, you had a couple of questions for us. Do you want to ask one of those? Sure. I mean, I think we talked about this a little bit already, but um, we can see if we can if there's any new ground to cover on the first one. It was just, um, do you think there's a there, there's a scene in the movie where um, Anthony Quinn's character doesn't want his picture taken by the journalist because he uh, Lawrence says he thinks that the camera will steal his soul. And um, I thought that it seemed like obviously Lawrence's character is the one who kind of loses his soul here, but I wasn't sure if he thought that was more because he buys into like this myth that the media is sort of creating of him, or if he thought it was more of an effect of just like being in the middle of like a brutal war and a, or like a, you know, in a brutal landscape, like the desert is obviously like a very brutal landscape to try to survive in and, you know, cross multiple times. So I just didn't know if there was like an, any opinion on that or like some kind of combination of the two where that fell for you guys. It was sort of like the media acceptance of him doing this means that it was kind of like a check mark for him to actually continue to do what he was doing. Yeah. Yeah, for him to say, oh, yeah, I am great. <laughs> Everybody back home thinks I'm amazing. I'm the, I'm the face of this uh, campaign. I'm a, I'm a hero, you know. Do you think he really bought into that and that sort of led him down the darker path? Or do you think it was more, you think it kind of would have gone on anyway because he's in this, he's, he's there. He's in this, like, brutal world. I think it's a combination of both. It's a good question, even if I don't have a very good answer. <laughs> oh. I guess it depends on how you define soul, but I wonder if it's more that he doesn't even start off with one. He's like trying to find a soul in a way because mm -hmm. he doesn't know who he is or who he's supposed to be in the world as I think how he's portrayed. And so then he he thinks he finds this identity that's going to pull something out of him and make him a bigger man. And then he finds that, oh no, this just exacerbates my problems. I have a lot of issues and I need to work on myself. And then he disappears from public life after this. Just go to therapy, man. Like, sure. Go to therapy. He goes for Look, a motorcycle For ride. British yeah. people, therapy is going to other countries and doing whatever the fuck you want. So. That's what colonialism is. It's yeah. therapy it's for white true. people. <laughs> yeah. But I don't think he starts off with like n having no, you know, um, identity. Like, I think he doesn't like the identity that he has, sure. but I think like he has like a moral compass. I mean, at the beginning of the movie, he he says, I'm not friends with murderers. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the movie, he's got murderers as his like personal bodyguards. Mm -hmm. And so I think he does come into it, you know, as like an idealist, a sort of an idealist, but mm -hmm. by the end of it, he's like this completely, like he's just like this husk of a person with like almost no, like, I mean, he has, he, I would assume when he got back to Britain, he had to do a lot of work on himself to feel sort of like a human person again, <laughs> or at least in the movie, that's how it seems. I haven't read the book, so I don't know. But um, at the end of the movie, he's kind of just like destroyed, destroyed by this. I personally take into account the torture scene as another thing that mm -hmm. really pushed yes. him to a very dark, dark place. So right. I think I don't know if that's an excuse or or what have you, but I really think it had more of an effect than. Uh, oh, it, I, I I think the film shows that it does. He, yeah. he yeah. changed. Every little thing does. Yeah, oh. he's very very changed after that experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I was actually going to ask about that. The, the scene featuring Lawrence's torture by the Turks has been very discussed and interpreted over the years. Um, so what did everyone make of that scene in the movie? Laura, you've kind of started us off on that. So I think that that was that year's version of saying he was um, brutally and sexually raped and tortured um, at the pleasure of Jose Ferrer, <laughs> um, the guy who played the Turkish um, colonel. And I think it was done well and chillingly. And I think there's sort of 
it was, it was, it was very disturbing. So I think there's actually a connection between Alicia's question and this one, where I think as he's going into that scene, like when he and Omar Sharif walk into that city, he's acting so cocky and thinks he's not going to get caught because he's like the biggest thing there is. But also somehow no one is going to know him, even though there's a bounty on his head and all this stuff. So I think he is so far outside of reality in terms of his self-importance. And that leads him then to instantly get captured, I think definitely get raped and like totally breaks him and causes this issue for the rest of the movie. Interestingly too, um, Jose Ferrer, that's the guy's name who is the Turkish colonel, he was paid so much money to be in this movie. <laughs> he was paid $25,000, which was more than Peter O'Toole and Omar Sharif combined. <laughs> and he got wow. a Porsche and a Porsche for that five minute scene there. Yeah. Isn't that insane? I read that earlier today and I was just like, are you fucking kidding me? If I was Peter O'Toole, I'd be like, I lived in the desert for like a year for this movie and endured like all these injuries. I, no, you yeah. need to give me more than like what? Fifteen thousand well, dollars. I mean, this no, was a break breakout role for Peter O'Toole. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. No I hope he had a good contract and got like, what is it when you get like dividends on the movie? I don't think residuals. Did. I don't do that residuals. Then. Residuals. Um, yes. Get those residuals. But I mean, ho- yeah. I, I think in a way it makes sense. I, yeah, it's totally not fair, but it makes it makes sense as as far as the way these things usually happen in movies and the movie business. I think because Jose Ferrer was. A big name. He's a guy who can like hold a scene. Like he basically comes in and the movie becomes his, as far as I'm concerned, for like the the length of time he's on he screen said it or was... lurking off screen. <laughs> he um, said it was the most like I forget exactly the word, but essentially like the most like impactful role he ever had. Like yeah. for him personally. Mm-hmm. He was like those five minutes that I was in that movie, like that's my career right, right there. Yeah. But he he's like a guy who brings a lot of weight to a movie that people needed a lot of weight to be in it. Like there were so many expectations on this movie and it's like in so many ways, I think maybe the pivotal scene in the movie, um, because like Alicia was saying, it's like the the turning point for him yeah. where he goes completely dark and kind of embraces his darker impulses in a way that I think those things are always there for him. Like they show it in the smallest way with the, the, the match thing at the beginning. Um, and then this like exacerbates all of that in this telling at least um, no i mean i get it but yeah. still twenty five thousand yeah, no. dollars and a porsche <laughs> yeah, yeah. like come on <laughs> i mean he's probably doing a favor for sam spiegel or david Lee or something like it, i don't know but yeah. yeah it's not fair but it, it it also makes sense in the context of the film and um mm-hmm. how they did stuff back then i think and how they still do stuff they still do yeah. stuff yeah um but yeah that that scene like i i guess um Matt, I'm curious, like, since you read Seven Pillars of Wisdom, if you can remember how that scene plays out in the book, because it's been very discussed, written about, talked about over the years of, like, did it even happen? Was he raped? Did he stop a rape uh, by kneeing the guy in the groin? Um, I think even, I'll throw this in there, I I don't think it was clear to people when the movie came out in 1962 that a, a rape was implied. Because just different sensibilities at the time, but I've heard people talk about that. That people were like, "That was supposed to be a rape scene." I didn't get that. And I think if you watch it today, it's a little <laughs> more um, clear that that's what they were going for. Because they're, I don't know, just we've been so sort of, um, we we've seen so many depictions of rape or near rapes or more subtly done um, over the years since then. But yeah, Matt. I mean, the short answer is I don't know. I, okay. I mean, I read Seven <laughs> Pillars of Wisdom when I was eighteen, I think. So, um, but I, but my understanding is that he was pretty consistent about there being some sexual abuse that happened in that situation, and everyone around him said he was different afterwards, right? Like that, the, that's a pretty consistent narrative as far as I understand it. Although I'm no expert, um, but I will say, like in relation to this question and the one about the the camera stealing the soul. Like I, I like I interpret those now. I do feel like these are scenes in the movie where David Lean is kind of this is this is the subversive part of it. I think where he's kind of letting you know that you're being given a particular story in a particular right in a particular way. Like it's not telling you exactly what happens in Durov because 
that's a, I mean, they're, they're not coming down on one side or another, I guess, on what happens in there, right? So that's got to be left sort of up for interpretation. You know, the camera stealing your soul, right? In some respects, and, and Arthur Kennedy's character is, is very clear about this, right? Like, I'm here to tell a particular story. I, it doesn't really matter what's actually happening. I'm here to tell a particular story to my audience for a particular purpose, right? Um, and there are other places where where the dialogue indicates, right, that 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 the movie itself, right, is is soulless in some respect or another. It's it's a it's a story devoid from reality, right? Like um, Faisal tells Lawrence early on, right, like you know, my father started this revolt, right? You people aren't starting this revolt. This is this is this is our revolt. I think that was an instance of your your um you kind of showing what what's happening just from the editing. I was looking at it again. I looked at that scene and just. I think when the 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 bay's lips are sort of like moving a little bit and then you see mm -hmm. um Lawrence's eyes just sort of bug you're just like oh he's definitely in trouble. Right. Um but then also what what Laura has brought up about his sadomasochism is like even when he was getting beaten there was like no expression on his face at all. Like he just was sort of like his eyes were just moving. Um right. so. And apparently in real life he would pay people to beat him while Bach played or something like that. Like after this. Oh, wow. oh, okay, I thought you meant before. Yeah. So. No, 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 after this. So, and Peter O'Toole or? No. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. I'm not sure that that's been substantiated. Sure, well, there's, I mean, I think there's a lot of questions, yeah. right? Like, I don't, I don't think he ever married. He, which like, whatever, you know, and like, but he, there was questions if he was gay. There was some rumors at least about some masochism there were rumors about this and i think it was like in his journal he ripped out the pages from that time but then it was written somewhere else or he told people so there's there is sort of this like conflicting thing right. but i think that the director said his intention was to show that he was raped there right. i mean subtly because it was the 60s and i think there were probably codes and stuff like that but um i think that there were even people uh, I'm not sure w w what year this was, like if it was after the book or after the movie or whatever, but there were people who said that there was no way he could have even been in that city on those dates. There, and I don't know if they were just being contrarian and trying to shoot this guy's story down or what, or if, if there's, if that's a possibility or not. But, um, but I think what Matt said is also true. Like he told versions of that story a lot and other people then repeated them. So it's, sort of the overriding narrative one way or another. And and as far as the movie is con concerned, me is right, like that it was what was intended. Yeah, Alicia. I do think it's like a pivotal turning point in the movie, as you mentioned. Like, I think like what you see after that, I mean, already he was kind of like going down a questionable path, but maybe not necessarily like a super dark path. <laughs> but then after this happens, he really becomes like a dark character. And it, it obviously was like, traumatized a traumatizing event and um yeah i mean i didn't enjoy watching it but i it definitely like it definitely like <laughs> is the probably the most important sequence for the second half of the film to me so me. much too it like it tied in with his lack of parentage i don't know what the word is that i'm looking for here but like you know he's a uh, his father's bastard son so he can never marry well he can never enter a certain class of society you know obviously like that was like such a big deal in england at the time so it's like you're already never gonna be no matter what he accomplished to a certain extent he was never gonna be a real like full man in the way that he wanted to be i think in british society and maybe he did end up accomplishing enough to overcome that but i think there's got that got it that had to be part of something that was driving him and now he's been sexually assaulted raped it's just this other way that he's been you know defiled and isn't enough of a man to like protect himself or to not have this happen to him or whatever so to me it was just like there were already these cracks there in him and then this was just like off to the races with his brutality that came out after it mm -hmm. I'm wondering if this could take us into Alicia's second question then. The second question was, um, since none of us has ever experienced war or armed conflict, did you find it easy or more difficult to tap into 
what Lawrence goes through, were you able to draw any personal parallels to um, his transition from sort of idealist to defeated sort of cynic? <laughs> I don't know if cynic is like not really the right word, but just like this sort of defeated, shattered, you know, person. I would say that I personally could relate to him at varying points of the film for different reasons. Um, it's just such, and I think it's got a lot to do with his his quality of acting and his portrayal of it. It's just, it's on a human level. I think we all kind of relate personally to, to what we're seeing. And the idea of war in and of itself is something I've never come close to. So I could never even begin to, to try to understand it. It's beyond me and I don't know how people do it. And it's something that's completely foreign to me. Kind of to Laura's point, like I think you can see yourself in Lawrence at various stages, just trying to figure yourself out and being in a situation where you're sort of in it, but you're not really that invested in it. And then when you go somewhere where people, where you respect the people that you're around and they respond in kind, you sort of feed off of that. And then after you get to a certain point, you just want to continue with that. So you'll do anything almost in order to stay where you are until mm -hmm. something might happen where it, it completely breaks you down, but you don't have those tools necessarily that you built up through your part of your life to deal with something like that. So then you can go off the rails really easily. I'm not saying that like that's happened to me, but I can totally understand that's what he might've been going through. Not that this is an armed conflict, but when I saw this question, what it made me think of is like COVID and everything that we've gone through in the last year and a half. And just like, there's totally been moments where I was like, I'm losing my mind right now. And, and I think that people, other people are in infinitely more stressful situations than I am with like having to take care of kids or having lost a job or having actually lost someone to COVID. But to me, it's just like some of the things that I have felt or thought about other people in this country <laughs> over the last year. And I think especially like the last couple of weeks as things start to get bad again, I, you know, not that I'm going to go massacre a caravan of people, but like I can see how you can just kind of start to go down that road start there. Yeah. yeah. And how you can kind of just start to lose yourself in this like, like January 6th. Yeah. Sure. I... Yeah. That too. Yeah. Totally. But it's just... I think we're all a lot more susceptible than we give ourselves credit for. I mean, I didn't even think about this in terms of like QAnon or conspiracy theories. So maybe I'll save that for our episode when we come back to <laughs> movies somehow. But I just think it's, we're all a lot more fragile than we think, or it's easy to be that if things kind of fall apart in our lives. And I can see how his story of like, going into this environment, you know, having some successes, if you want to consider them successes, getting really built up, but then you have these inner demons that you just like can't quit and are just becoming more and more and kind of taking over. And if everyone's just giving you free license to do what you want, I mean, doesn't that sound like our last president to a certain extent? Like, and here yeah. we are. So I think that's totally valid. I, I didn't even think about that when I asked the question. I was I asked the question because I had a difficult time finding an emotional way in or like a parallel for myself. But like, that's a really good, that's a really good one. No, I think it's just also, I've just been so, fr like the backsliding that's happening right now. Like we're all sitting here wearing masks, even though we're vaccinated. Like I don't, it's just, I feel really frustrated right now. So maybe I identify more with the the dark side right now. I do also want to talk about this movie and Star Wars maybe for a minute once we like get out of this question. Though. Really? Yeah. How? Oh, uh, so similar. I mean, it's definitely an influence. Yeah, Is I can it? see some similarities yeah. for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, they also and have... who is Princess Leia in Lawrence of Arabia? Is that Omar Sharif? Omar Sharif. She... <laughs> <laughs> Not like that, but like, I mean, obviously the setting, Kidding. I think just like the epic <laughs> scale of it, the fight more, I guess more so like to me, the setting. Both have but... Alec Guinness. But, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. All right. I don't really have an answer for Alicia's second question, I think. I, I thought of COVID, but then you, you covered that pretty well. 
so I don't have anything to add on that. Um, I mean, yeah, I just meant like, did were you were you emotionally affected by the film? Because I kind of didn't find myself emotionally affected by it that much. I think I am definitely emotionally impacted by the film. Always have. It's changed over the years, like I've said. Um, I think it's an easy movie to sort of layer your current interpretation of the world onto at any point in your life. Um, I, I remember during the, the Bush years, all this talk of the great man theory, and that was how he was going to try to like save the country after nine 11 and all this horse shit. And, you know, like he was revering like Winston Churchill and people like that. And, I, I think I'd already sort of like seen the cracks in those facades for myself at that point in my life of just getting old enough to be like, this is horseshit that people think that just, uh, you know, one person can be this overarching force for good in the world. They're always more complicated than that. And I, I think that this movie kind of takes that on in a way, uh, the whole great man theory of just sort of, you know, saying, yeah, people can be like very uh, remarkable, as, as Matt said earlier, but it's not all good. You know, <laughs> there's a lot of like layers to it and a lot of bad with it. And but I'm there for the journey. I'm there to kind of like see what happens to this guy because it's it's compelling to watch. And I do think I've emotionally invested in it and always have been. Um, I'm I'm not sure if I can completely put my finger on why I passed that, though, I guess. Matt, do you want to say something on that? I mean, at this point, again, I, it's earlier in my life, I thought, oh, Lawrence is a role model, right? Um, which is not great. <laughs> but now I watch it, and, I th and, and what resonates with me mostly now is what it's like for me as a historian trying to tell the stories of peoples and cultures that aren't mine, um, honestly. And so, so Lawrence of Arabia is sort of a cautionary tale for me, um, you know, in terms of how you can kind of not not do that well if you're not real careful, uh, particularly coming from the kind of background that I have. Um, and it's also, it's also a, a, in some respects, a, identify, identify with Lawrence in the sense of, you know, I, I have been in those types of situations where I am definitely the fish out of water in certain contexts, right? And the goal of effectively not trying to make it all about yourself, right? Um, being sort of front and center in my mind as I'm as I'm doing uh, the kind of work that I do now in a way that I don't think Lawrence or Lawrence of Arabia necessarily um, uh, privileges right that interpretation. I do I think it is very much all about Lawrence, right? Um, and and you know obviously I, I've made it clear that I think that's a problem. <laughs> this is kind of reminded me also of our conversation early on in the podcast about Citizen Kane and. Uh, to me, that's another character who, on, for the most part, he's a piece of shit. Um, but he's, to me, also super compelling to watch. And I am invested in watching the story um, just because it's kind of fascinating to watch the unraveling of a person. Uh, and I, I think that there's a lot of that in Lawrence of Arabia, too. And I think there's other, like, surface-level parallels of, like, the whole... Um, the movie is framed as a flashback to explore who this guy was. I mean, they don't do it exactly the same, but it's got that framing device. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I don't know. Maybe that's it. But it reminded me of Citizen Kane in some ways at points. So does anybody want to talk about like any of the craft of, of the film, like the editing, the, the cinematography, music, anything like that? It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> nice work, editors and other filmmakers. Right. The sun was a real character in that movie, I thought. The sun itself. And oh, it yeah. just felt hot. Like the first half of the movie, I was super invested in just the scenery and just the pace was just really incredible. It felt like you were actually in the desert with them. Mm -hmm. And and I think Alora had mentioned at some point that she felt thirsty when she was watching <laughs> Yeah, when I sent the I sent the email two hours and <laughs> To watching film yeah. need water i thought the music was a little west side story -y. like it just it reminded me a lot of that film hmm. mm -hmm. just being big and kind of overwrought big and brassy and yeah. you know the same kind of like hooks and it just sounded very similar mm. interesting i wouldn't have thought of that i can't be very impartial about the score i feel like I, it got its hooks in me when i was at an age where i'm like yeah. 
it's kind of big and over the top, but it works for me at this point. Yeah. Yeah. I really like the score. Connected to what Laura said about being thirsty while watching the movie. There's, I don't know how apocryphal this story is, but supposedly when the movie premiered in London uh, at the intermission, they sold more beverages than they ever had or something like that. I don't remember exact story, but there's something basically saying the same thing. Everyone was very thirsty from watching this movie. And, and I, I think that the, uh, the scope of the film and how, how it's portrayed, especially when you see it on a big screen, it's like, it's overwhelming. Um, in that way. You're making me thirsty just talking yeah. about it. Yeah, me too. Yeah. <laughs> Alicia? Um, I was just going to say, like, I, I thought, I also agree they did a great, obviously, like, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful film, like, visually stunning. And, um, and yeah, and I was really, even though I'd seen it before and I knew, like, they made it, I was, like, still worried about them, like, the first time that they crossed the desert. I'm like, oh, I was like, do people die in this? I can't remember if someone dies in this scene, like what happens here? Like, do they make it all right or not? And I was really legitimately like worried about them. And then the other scene that like, I really think it's like visually interesting is when um, Omar Sharif's character comes riding in and just starts off as like the dot mm -hmm. all the way on the horizon. And you're like, what are we looking at? And then right. he just like slowly comes into, I just, I love that. Yeah, I actually wanted to ask a question about uh, the cinematography and the pacing, because that was something I was really paying attention to this time as well. Uh, and I, I I remembered having that thought watching the Omar Sharif scene this time. And I know that like the movie is so big, like if you see it on a big screen, you, the pacing is a little different, I feel like, than um, smaller movies because there's so much to take in that they have to kind of leave the shot up a little longer for some of those shots. And also like the Omar Sharif thing. If if you're seeing that on a giant screen, you're going to see him quicker than when you're watching it on even a big screen TV at home. Um, so mm -hmm. there's just, it's a different experience. And I was wondering if that affected it for anybody who's only seeing it for the first time or has only seen it on a television or a smaller device than a screen, a big screen. What, what I noticed about the pacing is that each hour had sort of a, a period at the end of it. Um, each hour in and of itself was a chapter of the book of the film. Um, and I know that because every time I had to stop, whether it was just to take five second break, get some water, it was always the next hour. Hmm. And they just stood alone to me. Um, and, then, and, that, and so for that, the pacing made sense. I was okay with the distance just because it made me anticipate what are we looking at? So I was kind of in, you know, it's sort of like the, not sort of like, but it was with the, the shark and jaws, like you anticipate something coming, but you're not mm -hmm. sure what it is, but you're excited to know what it is. So mm -hmm. I felt like a lot of the pacing was like that. It was, I was enjoying what I was seeing and I wasn't so worried about like, should this be faster or slower edited? Um, I was kind of curious about when some of the movies, when they cut down the movie, because mm -hmm. I, I guess there's different versions of it. How did they actually cut it down? Do they just cut down some of those scenes that were carried out or was there actual like scenes that they cut out? I don't know if anybody knows the answer to that, but I was just curious. I haven't gotten to that part of the, this book I'm rereading yet to, to be able to speak very clearly on that. I think I remember from reading it years ago though, that like, I, I think a lot of times the first thing to go when they'd cut down these longer movies that had these sort of road show uh, presentations with like the overture and the intermission, those are the first things to go a lot of times, I think. Uh, mm, yeah. Mm. Cut out those parts. I think they might've cut down the motorcycle scene at the beginning somewhat, because mm. I, I, I have a pretty clear memory of them talking about for the restoration in 1989 of put finding all this footage to put back in of that because it was sort of a jumble or something. It's a long scene. Yeah. He goes, you know, and then he comes back. Right. I think it's good though. Cause I was like, wait, he dies here. Right. Like I couldn't totally remember from the last thing, mm. but when he's like going down the road and shaking and all that, I was like, Oh my God, I, I literally said to Jeremiah, I feel so anxious right now watching him. Yeah. So I think if it was, I can't imagine it being shorter. I mean, maybe like two seconds shorter or something. No, but... me neither. I wasn't yeah. like, you know, gagging for it to be over or anything. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, sometimes stuff gets shorter over the years too because they lose pieces of it. So it might not mm. have been that they meant to cut that down, but they had to cut it down to have a negative that they could strike prints from and send out um, until they restored it and 
89. Interesting. Um, beyond that stuff, I'm not sure what they cut down, but I think the shortest the movie got was like, uh, I don't, uh, it's somewhere between 20 and 40 minutes shorter, I think, at, at the shortest. Um, mm. And I just think that would suck to watch <laughs> personally. Because mm. I don't feel like there's ever fat on the bone. I, I feel like it's all working towards telling the story in, in a way that makes sense to me. Does anybody else feel differently about that? or It's all meat, no fat. <laughs> it's just so beautiful, too. Like, the landscape is so incredible. And I think, you know, I got to imagine, I mean, I know people in the 60s, like, knew what the desert looked like. But, like, to see that on the big screen, it just must mm -hmm. for, especially people in who hadn't necessarily seen pictures of that or had only seen it in like a National Geographic or something like that, maybe like it must have been just so striking. Still is. Yeah. Mm. What did everybody think of the sound, honestly? Because I was kind of it took me out of it sometimes because it felt like they had looped the sound later because it's outside. The voices were so much lower than the music. Yeah. Or yeah. Or it just didn't seem to match with them being outside. I had to watch it with subtitles. Mm. I definitely found that as being an issue. Oh, and this was the, the remastered version that I watched. I watched too. it on Amazon. Yeah. Whatever that one was. I didn't even notice. Yeah, Same I problem. Really notice. I you don't, guys I don't... probably have the hookup, though. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, Jeremiah yeah, I just have... can, like... <laughs> you know? the sound I don't know if it's that count. for me, or it's just that I know the movie so well that I know what they're saying already. So, like, it doesn't bother me. Um, I don't know. I did have to rewind a couple times to like I don't remember I don't remember if I watched it with captions or not because sometimes I do and sometimes I don't watch stuff on captions because I like to challenge myself with accents sometimes. <laughs> but um, I do remember like sometimes when he was talking to the general that I would have to kind of his accent was like so mm. kind of like posh. I don't know if that's the right word, but it was so like of its era, like right. that sort of British, like blah, blah, blah type of thing that I had to kind of, um, kind of <laughs> no offense to British people, because I love you really. Their accents are <laughs> but, hard though. But yeah, sometimes their accents can be a little bit difficult. And so I did have to go back, but I can't remember if I was having issues with the volume. I mean, I do think I, I do think the music was a little overly loud sometimes. So I did have to like turn that down when that was going on. But um but I didn't. Uh, I don't remember having any issues with the sound too much, other than other than the accent stuff. You all should check the settings on your TV or your apps that you're watching it on, because it might be trying to play you the surround sound, and you don't have surround sound speakers or something, because th that'll cause issues with your um, the levels between the dialogue and music. Noted. Just adjust your rabbit ears a little <laughs> bit, you know? So I'm sure we all noticed and we didn't talk about it and that's totally fine. But there is like literally zero women in this movie mm -hmm. other than the ones that, you know, do the like war chant when they're heading out to Aqaba and then the ones that are murdered later. In yeah, the movie. I found the murdered chicks. Yeah. I was that like, was of, really course, was disturbing. of course I they have to put a nurse. them here. There's a nurse at the end, I believe. Oh, okay. Oh. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But so interestingly enough, uh, there was this woman, and Matt, you might know more about this actually than I do, but there was a woman named Gertrude Bell who was a historian and historian. Uh, she was British in Cairo back in the day. And apparently she is the one who actually taught the real Lawrence, like, these are all the tribes and here's like the relationships between them. And they were really good friends. And she basically gave him like the knowledge base that he needed to like launch from to do all of this she doesn't even get a freaking scene in the movie it's just like all him so and she had i read a book about her a while ago and i meant to kind of skim through it again before uh we recorded this and then i just ran out of time but she was like this british woman she moved to cairo had like this very adventuresome life there and stuff so i'll try and pull a few more things about her when we do our catch-up episode because just feel, I'd never heard of her before and I was like oh what like there was this British woman running around and was friends with all these kings and mm -hmm. apparently was like yeah. this very behind the scenes power broker like who fucking knew so one thing I I learned from this book is that his estate stipulated that there could basically be no major female characters in the film because they were afraid uh, that it would be turned into a romantic subplot and they didn't oh, want that Jesus to be part of his story yeah. Um, mm -hmm. so that was mm -hmm. sort of their way of cutting them off from even entertaining that thought. 
Um, I'm not saying that's the right thing that they should have done or anything like that. And I'm curious if Matt has anything to say on uh, the Gertrude Bell of it all. Or... I've heard of Gertrude Bell. I'm trying to remember now um, whether the uh, Herzog film Queen of the Desert. Has anyone seen that? Is that about Gertrude That's Bell or probably, is that about the book Mary I read, The book I read was called Queen of the Desert. Okay. That was about her. So, so there's a film that Bernard Herzog made about ah. Gertrude Bell starring Nicole Kidman. I think mm-hmm. it was. Um, it's mm-hmm. not really about her time in the in the Middle East, but um, maybe worth a, a viewing if you're interested in her. I'll do some digging. My other story is a happier woman story. So, you know, obviously it's huge production. They had all of these people like back office infrastructure where they were filming and there was a British phone switchboard operator there named Tony Gardner. Somehow she met the King of Jordan. He would like, I guess, come and like check on filming or whatever. He spotted her and fell in love with her and they got married and she was his third wife they were married for 10 years their child they had a few kids together and one of them is the current king of jordan so i just thought that was this really crazy random story like imagine being a british like i'm assuming like a young woman british telephone operator and you meet the king of this country and who happens to be related to Faisal. Yes, right. true. Yeah. I think one of their sons <laughs> was named Faisal. His uh, Faisal's brother was the first king of Jordan. And yeah. Wow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's all in the family. Yeah. It sounds it sounds like you have two uh, spin-off movies that you're going to yeah. try to produce in the end. Yes. Yes. <laughs> what I also found fascinating cuz they were married from 61 to 71, she still lives in Jordan. Like she didn't like mm. move back to England or anything like that. So I have to assume that like she kind of fell in love with the country and the people and all that and stayed there so which is where she nice hated place. england we went to it it's yeah a, we went to jordan it's the shit everyone should go it's so beautiful like go 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 once the stupid panini is over panini panini <laughs> that's a code word for um so i'm just like a young kid yeah, yeah, that's what the kids call the kids it. call them words that are not pandemic like panini or another peacock whatever okay. so well, what was everyone's favorite scene, moment, or element of the movie? It's a cliche, I guess, but when Lawrence blows out the the uh, mm. match, and then you just see the big screen because that was the the scene where I was really blown away. So that opening scene and just kind of leads you into the movie. It kind of reminded me also of the Searchers when all of a sudden you just see like what's out from the cabin. Yeah, not in the same respect, but it just sort of opened the movie for me. So. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say that too, so I'll just jump in and say that. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, it's, it's I think, one of the most famous edits in film history. It's one of my favorite edits in film history. The other one for me being the cut in 2001 uh, from the bone flying through the air after the ape man throws it to the satellite hundreds of thousands of years later or whatever it's supposed to be. But uh, anyway, it's a giant part of film history. It's a great moment in the movie it sets up what's coming in such a fantastic way it's my favorite and the editor and and v coates is an amazing editor uh she also edited for instance out of sight which is superbly edited um and she's just great there can't have been that many female editors well no actually like uh, oh. Women that could be editors much more easily than a lot of other roles in Hollywood back in the day because huh. it was considered at first sort of like secretarial work or something. Um, and then it turned into more of an art form over the years. And some women were able to kind of um, make names for themselves that way. Interesting. But, yeah. yeah. Uh, anybody else with favorite moments or scene or anything? There's a scene where it's just the sky and the sand and it goes on for at least a full minute, minute, if not more. And it's so beautiful. And to me, that was, I think, the most beautiful scene in the film. I liked a few different ones, but I loved um, I loved the one where he's dancing around in his new robes. I really love that stupid scene. <laughs> um, but then I also really liked the... Um, when they're when he's like first out in the desert and I don't know if it's the same I don't think it's the same scene you guys are talking about but where it's at night and you just see the mm. like all mm. the constellations in the night sky I guess that's not the same scene you're talking about but um yeah I just thought that's a really beautiful 
because I can't remember the match blowing out moment. So I couldn't remember what that was. But anyway, anyway, the other scene that I really like is the one with the constellation uh, and the stars in the sky at night. I thought was really beautiful. That might be when he's out in the desert trying to think of the plan for Aqaba. I'm, I'm not sure, though. Maybe. Um, Matt or Mia? I mean, the, the cheesiest, most melodramatic moment that, that I think is really well done, though, is when he gets to Suez and the guy's riding by on the motorcycle and he just gets off and yells, who are you? Who are you? Right. Right. <laughs> and it's a little on the nose, but I like it. Yeah. But the other the other one that I was really like is he likes your lemonade where he goes back oh, into yeah. his when he brings the, the his ward basically yeah. at that point into oh, the, yeah. the officer's club. <gasps> And it's a whole two whole large to-do. glasses of lemonade. Yeah. <laughs> I really liked when Omar Sharif rode up. Like, I just think that's such a cool scene. And I'm definitely looking forward to seeing it on the big screen someday. So I feel like, as always, we've we've danced around this question the entire discussion um, so far. But has the movie, as far as you're concerned, stood the test of time? Do you think it resonates today? Well, I had a tough time with it, but I do think it's an important story. Um, I just, I just found it a little hard to connect with, but I do think, um, I do think, yeah, obviously people still lose themselves in in war and people still do get traumatized and take paths that aren't, that they shouldn't take. And I do think it still has a meaning. I think it does stand the test of time. And and obviously like visually it stands the test of time and in that way. I think it does um, because the main character is definitely somebody that you can identify with and follow and you understand what he's going through, even if you don't agree with what he's doing. Um, from So from a story standpoint, I think it's worth seeing. And visually, it just is incredible to, to see. So I feel like you'll get something out of it, even if you don't exactly agree with the politics of the, the movie. I think it's still worth seeing and it still does stand up. I think it resonates. I think it stands the test of time. Like. Obviously, I think with this exact movie come out in 2021, no, um, but I think it is just such an important part of the film canon. One thing, too, I meant to say this earlier and just real quick, I thought it was interesting. This is on the director's poll for Sight and Sound, but it's never been on the critics poll. And I just think that's so <laughs> wild because it's like a pretty critically acclaimed movie it's not like oh one that directors love but critics don't or something. And I just thought that was really interesting especially because it's not like some slouch on the pole, you know, it's like a really famous, well-regarded movie. So anyways, I thought that was interesting. I did read um, the 1962 uh, New York Times critic, you know, when they were reviewing the movie and they didn't really particularly care for it. Yeah. Yeah. Is that the one that, is that the one that called it a camel opera? Yeah. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Sure. Not like every critic, but I think especially like over time, not that the sight and sound poll is necessarily like the freshest, you know, as we've talked about, but I was just surprised that it wouldn't even be on there. You think there'd be enough critics that like it at this point in time? I mean, I I have a feeling it's on the poll. It's just not in the top 10. Um, It's probably somewhere in in the list, though, if you go further down. Um, But yeah, yeah. yeah, you're probably right. Um. I'll just say that I do think it stands the test of time. I do think, I mean, because it's an important part of film history, yes, but also I think the story is still uh, relevant in ways. I think it's like so many things, especially things from decades ago, you have to watch it with a, a good critical eye and, you know, bring some intelligence to to it. But I think it's a movie that you can read in several different ways. And I think that, uh, as I've said, I've done that over the years as I've gotten older and hopefully wiser. Uh, I think Matt has described a similar situation for himself. Uh, I think it's okay to be critical of a movie um, and and still uh, find it very impressive and enjoy it overall. Um, but I, I think that it's, uh, yeah, I still, I think it stands the test of time for sure. It's just like a fucking spectacle and it's great. <laughs> okay, so I checked real quick. It is in... 2012, it was number 81 on the critics' poll. Immediately before it, at number 80, is The Magnificent Ambersons. So I'm just going to let that Mm -hmm. sit there. All right. Just leave that there. That's how far far that movie fell. Uh, Magnificent Ambersons. Interesting. Um, Laura or Matt? I'll just say yes. Okay. Short and sweet. (laughs) 
Uh, Matt, how about you? I'll be the contrarian here. I'll say I actually don't think it stands the test of time very well at all. Mm -hmm. um, but I still can't imagine not recommending people to watch it. Um, but I don't think it does a particularly good job of, of a particularly good job of, of telling us anything about the world that we currently inhabit at this point. Not that we you couldn't get from any number of other movies. That said, it is still it, it is still gorgeous and it is compelling in a lot of ways. Um, uh, and I still, you know, I will, it's just such a deep part of me. I will never not love it in some way or another, but if you weren't like into movies, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if I would tell you, you need to watch this. Um, if you love movies and you're invested in the, the form and the, and the history of, of the development of that, uh, of that industry, then sure. Yeah, absolutely you got to see it, but just as a way to understand the world, I don't think it tells us very much anymore. We kind of got out of sync with our bonus questions from how we used to do this. So, um, we, the, the five of us are usually on the show answered this question last week or, or in the last episode, uh, when we talked about vertigo, uh, we asked about movies that pulled off the whole doppelganger or double concept and uh, but we went ahead and posted in the Facebook group and got a couple more suggestions. So I just wanted to share those real quick. Marie said Dead Ringers with Jeremy Irons and uh, Charlie suggested both The Double Life of Veronique uh, by one of his favorite directors, Christoph Kislowski. And he also cited a movie that I guess didn't pull it off well, Joe versus the Volcano. I never saw it. Um, but he said that he rewatched it a couple of years ago and it, quote, still sucks. Uh, so I guess that one didn't pull it off, like I said. Um, and does anybody have a bonus question related to Lawrence of Arabia, or should I go ahead and ask this one? No, I like this one. Okay. Yeah, it's a good one. So other than Lawrence of, Ar of Arabia, uh, what is one of your favorite biographical films? And I'll start off by answering that the first movie we discussed on this podcast, The Passion of Joan of Arc, is one of my favorites. And I think uh, I'll say that what I like about both of them as biopics is that they don't try to tell the entire life. I think that usually fails. They focus on something more specific, and that is how stories usually work best. I think that's a very fair um, critique of biopics because, yeah, it's, sometimes it's hard to like know what you're really <laughs> supposed to take from one other than just like this person had an interesting life. Um, the only one I could really think of that I liked a lot was Coal Miner's Daughter, uh, which was the Loretta Lynn biopic starring Sissy Spacek. Um, and then I'm, I'm sure there's others that I'm just not thinking of, but that's the only one that I could really think of that like I remember really fondly and like have seen a lot. Mine would be Malcolm X. Um, it came out in 1992 when I was a freshman in college, and it, of course, really struck a lot of African-Americans at that time. Um, and it was also when we were studying him in college as well. I took African-American studies. So my eyes were open to a lot of different things that year. Um, but I really enjoyed, and I know that that was a criticism that you had, Jeremiah, about like trying to pack in somebody's life <laughs> into, you know, two or three hours. But they did actually do that with this movie. And I felt like it did work. And Denzel Washington was so amazing in this movie that at certain points I would actually see speeches by Malcolm X, like videos, and you're, they're indistinguishable. Like he was, he did such a great job with that role that it was, it was just really well done. Um, but yeah, there was a lot of story to it and it was very dense, but I really loved every minute of it. Yeah. I think that's one of those that, that actually pretty much pulls it off packing so much of a, of a person's life into one movie. Um, I think it's the, one of the exceptions to it though for me. Yeah, I also really like Malcolm X when I was like coming up with a list of ones. I was like, that movie is so good. Like it's just so powerful. So I decided to go with one that I think like changed my mind about a person. <clears throat> and so uh, mine is I, Tanya, uh, which came out a few years ago and I thought was just so good and like really fun. And now I just want to rewatch it because I've been thinking about it all day. And also just made me like have a different perspective on her as opposed to the, you know, narrative at the time that came out. Um, so yeah, if you haven't seen it, I recommend it. Matt? I didn't think enough about this. Mm -hmm. uh, say La Bamba. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There you go. 
Um, and Laura. I chose Sid and Nancy, uh, the 1986 movie with Gary Oldman and um, it's uh, Chloe Webb. And I, you know, I, I'm not sure the actors are as fond of it when they talk about the film, but it was a very formative film for me. Well, our next episode is my third pick, Eight and a Half. It's directed by Federico Fellini. It was released in 1963. And for people who want to watch it uh, along with us, it's available to stream with a subscription on the Criterion channel, HBO Max or Canopy. It's also available to rent via Amazon, Google, Apple, and several other places. Um, so that's it for this episode of the Stereoactive Movie Club. We invite you to join us in our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash Stereoactive Movie Club. You can also email us at stereoactivemovieclub at gmail.com, or you can send us a voice message on our show page at anchor.fm slash stereoactivemovieclub. Thanks for listening. This podcast is produced by Stereoactive Media.